and welcome to Coffee and Geography, where my guests and I geek out about the world and everything on it, discovering that we are all geographers in some way, shape or form. I am your host, Kit, and my pronouns are they, them or she, her. So settle down with a brew, hit that subscribe or follow button and enjoy the listen. Hello everybody and welcome back to Coffee and Geography and this is got to be one of the best intro bios I've ever received from a guest. You ready folks? Sit back and listen and then my guest is going to pick up straight from when I when I finish. Here we go. It's almost like a story. Listen. In the world before YouTube and the internet, the opportunities to be inspired were different and rare. In 1995, Dr. James Jackson gave the Royal Institution Christmas lectures called Earth, an Explorer's Guide on a relatively new idea on plate tectonics. And there, a young boy in Birmingham had his view changed of the world forever. He didn't know he wanted to do geography or study the world, but it started a journey that would end up nearly three decades decades later with his podcast. With the incredible support and guidance of geography teachers, David Rees read geography at university and postgrad before training to be a geography teacher in southeast London. He taught in schools for 13 years as a teacher and head department. He's been involved in UCAS, which is the University and Colleges Administration Admission System, and support and uh, lots of school adventures before moving to initial teacher training education at Teach First in 2021. David, take it from there. I want to hear about Dr. James Jackson. So uh, when I started my teacher training, I remembered this amazing set of videos that that James Jackson had put together in the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. And back when I started, so we're talking, oh, I don't know, 2005, 2006, something like that, the RI archive for all of their Christmas lectures wasn't complete. And it stopped in 1998. So there was no way of logging onto the website and getting the James Jackson lecture series. So I thought, well, you know, you might as well take a chance. And I Googled James Jackson, who was now Professor James Jackson at the University of Cambridge. And I found his email address and wrote to him and said, listen, Professor Jackson, you have no idea who I am. You, <laughs> We've never spoken. We've never met. But in 95, I watched your Christmas lectures and it changed the course of my academic journey. I'm now a geography teacher. I'd love to share that with my students. Thought nothing of it. Three, four days later in the post. I get an envelope from the University of Cambridge with a full set of the DVDs and a note from Professor Jackson that said, keep exploring on your journey. Love, James. That's I've still got the note, right? Like that is the class of the man, but it's also, I think, a really lovely story about what geography does to people, even though you don't know it's happening at the time or when it's happening, like some 20, 30 years later, you find out that that was the moment. Um, Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. Well, what a story to start the podcast episode with. So, yeah, th- that's excellent, David. So, folks, I have with me returning to Coffee and Geography, um, David Priest. So, um, and thank you so much, David, for doing that that little you, our first ever espresso in geography um, about the IPCC synthesis report. Um, so, folks, um, if you haven't listened to that yet, and uh, you know, please, please do go back just a just a couple of months and you'll see that there's a an espresso in geography it's only a 15 minute little episode where me and david are talking about um the ipcc reports and things like that and now i'm absolutely thrilled and delighted that i'm now sitting david sitting down with david for a full episode finally <laughs> got you eventually right david you got your drink with you what are you drinking um while we're chatting I'm actually drinking tea. I know it's coffee and geography, but for some reason, I've never got I've never got the coffee thing. I'm I'm just I can't. I I don't mind the smell of it. Um, we have it in the house. It, it you know, and the brewing of the Nespresso machine is a lovely smell, but it's just it's too bitter for me. Maybe I don't know. So I'm a tea drinker, I'm afraid. Any particular tea? Because of course, different blends taste different. But or is it just anything I, that's I'm as long as it's black? That, no, I'm not that. I'm not a tea snob. <laughs> um, I, I have friends who are and are really fussy about their tea, and I have friends who are very particular about loose leaf or whatever. I'm like, as long as it's in a cup, put me some milk in it, we'll be fine. I'm not that fussy about milk or tea bag first. Doesn't bother me. Uh, yeah, it's 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 easy for me. Uh, it's it's simple. On behalf of all those tea snobs, no offence taken. <laughs> so yeah, it's uh, no. We, I mean, we have. I mean, it's 
as as most folks know if if you're if this is the first podcast episode you're listening to folks the the name coffee and geography quite simply means basically a chat over a drink of us being geography geeks um that really all it is it just just seemed to roll off the tongue you know you needed some kind of catchy kind of um title but uh, <laughs> there we go good yeah i've got my tea as well david so you're, you're in good company right i want to go back and loop back to um a bit of your you know back to your bio but also where you locate because you said that you're a young uh birmingham lad but now you're in uh southeast london you're in the the greenwich area so um the question i, I always like to ask my guests is quite simply this so it's um your identity as a as a person maybe as a geographer now so you're in the southeast london it's a very iconic part of london greenwich not just well and and for for good reasons and for nefarious reasons it's a very iconic part of the world as well um so but being that that birmingham lad what about you today and your identity has been formulated by both where you've lived and you've grown up in the past to where you are now what makes david priest today in terms of geography um, it's a really interesting one because I think um, my identity is much more um, Birmingham probably than it is London. Um, I I moved to London when I came here to do postgraduate work and um, I moved down with a friend of mine who was starting to do her accountancy degree at the same time and we, we were looking for a flat share. We didn't really know what we were doing. We really didn't have an affinity for particular places. We were looking purely on price brackets and what was commutable because we both wanted to work in centre of London. Um, and and so we plonked on South East London by accident. And and I've kind of lived here ever since, really. Um, I've taught in South East London schools, but as an outsider, if you grow up in a school system, you know the rivalries, you know who you're supposed to like or dislike, you know who the football rivalry or the rugby rivalry or the oh we don't like them because like you know that as a child when you come in as a as a teacher you, you don't necessarily pick that up unless you're involved in those things I suppose if you're a sports coach you know your rivalries but I, I I'm not sporty in that sense I never <laughs> like that so um my identity is uh, I always feel like a little bit of a guest or a visitor in London even when I go into work in places in London and, and you know, Teach First's offices are in Greenwich Peninsula, they're, they're right by the O2, I find it really difficult to not take my phone out and take photos every time <laughs> I'm in the office. Because like, yeah. oh my God, that's the O2. Like, oh my God, that's the River Thames. <laughs> I, f I still find myself sort of feeling like a visitor and, and I, I guess looking at the numbers and scaring myself with the numbers I've actually lived in London for a greater part of my life than I ever lived in Birmingham. But but Birmingham is home. Birmingham is, you know, where my parents are and and where I grew up and and where kind of a lot of formative memories were for me and the things that shaped me. So yeah, I, there's always an interesting one if you think about your phone book or you know, if you think about your, you know, your contacts list, where have you got as home? Have you got it as your parents address? Or have you got it as like the house you live with your family now? And, and I think there's always this interesting thing, certainly for those of us who are, are lucky to have our parents still around. My mom and dad's house will always be home, not where I live. Like <laughs> this, is, this is my house. That's that's home. And it's it, it's a quick exercise of, oh, OK, yeah, why have I done that? It's, it's yeah. a weird one to me. That's I've, that's a really, really good good way of looking at it so folks are we listening right now if you if if you're not driving if you're driving obviously wait until you're, you've got a safe place to stop or you've reached your destination or if you're just listening in the kitchen so just have a look at your mobile now what what have you got labeled as as home or the equivalent of home is it your abode where you live now with your family or is it somewhere else that's a really really good that would make a really good geographical inquiry i'd think about the sense of place a sense of identity is like where is home for you are you removed from home or are you at home and and I think uh, I've I've found um, returning home is an interesting experience. So oh. when I grew up in Birmingham, um, for whatever reason, I can't really remember why it was, but for whatever reason, I didn't learn to drive at sixteen, seventeen. I, I learned to drive much later. I I learned to drive when I when I moved to London when I was you know early twenties, and I can't remember why. I'd, I'd, maybe it wasn't that important to me, or maybe I didn't feel like I had the money. Whatever it was at the time. 
but my perception and construction of place in Birmingham is based on public transport, walking, or getting lifts with my parents because that's how right. yeah. that's yeah. how I experienced Birmingham. I left home to go to university and then life happened and I learned to drive. But when I go back now as an adult to visit my parents and I go in my car, I'm like, oh, but that 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 was hours away, wasn't it? It's only taken me 10 minutes <laughs> to drive here. Gosh, that, that, that's miles away, but it's only five minutes in the car. What's happened? And my construction of place and scale is so weird. It's so jarring for me to go back as a sort of adult in inverted commas in a car and experience this interaction in a way that like it just is not it's not how I experienced it as a young boy growing up and and it's not what I remember it's so yeah weird. yeah that's really fascinating I so I because I I've got a similar experience to you in terms of time where I've now spent more time of my life most of my life living in Norfolk and either in or around Norwich than I have back in back in in Essex and 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 in northeast London um so but my my identity is that home for me will always be and even though I don't live in Norwich at the moment home for me will always be now the city of Norwich because I feel that that's where the core of my identity was formed and I have very little association back with where I'm from now. I mean, not not because not because my parents have moved out of there where we where I grew up, but it, that place just seems so alien to me now. I mean, there was one one occasion where I mean, like you said, like walking around uh, Harlow, you know, was and biking around. It was one of the things I used to do all the time as a kid. All the time as a kid. It's a huge spread out area because of it was a it was a new town. So uh, for the population of eighty thousand people that it has, it was actually really spread out. It took you quite a while to walk and cycle yeah. places, but it was a joy to do so. But now whenever I go back there in, in the car or something like that, it just it feels so different. And the last time I went back there, I just well, obviously I've rec quote unquote recognized the place, but I didn't feel it was my place anymore. And things were just flashing past without very little recognition or very little identity for me. I, I think it's an interesting one when you start, when you start to kind of unpick it. Like roots are an, a really interesting construction. So my mm. wife is Canadian, and she now has spent more of her life in the UK than she did growing up in Canada. Yeah, same with my wife. Yeah. When she's in the UK, she sounds Canadian and doesn't feel like she's here. And when she's in Canada, she sounds British and doesn't feel like she fits in Canada anymore. And there's that kind of, if you've lived in two places or you've had two big experiences or shaped your life in a binary, I suppose, as opposed to people who've lived in 15 or 16 locations, where do you sit in between what's the what's the what's the transatlantic equivalent for you like you sort of neither one nor t'other in in terms of geographic location is just such a weird just such a weird idea of experience and I, I don't think I sound people on the podcast will agree or disagree I to me <laughs> I don't have a strong Birmingham accent anymore um when I go home after a couple of weeks or a couple of days even speaking with my family, my Birmingham accent comes back and I sound yeah. more rough than I do now. When I first go back, I sound posh. They're like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> and it's, the, it's that strange thing about so much of your identity is wrapped up in place, accents, yeah. and, you know, what's familiar and what's not, what you know or what you don't and all of those things. It's so, so odd, so yeah. odd. I think for, if if you're really intrigued by what David is saying here, folks, you should go back and listen last to last year in season two when I spoke to uh, Louis Viz, um, who is. Now I do apologise, Louis, if I, if I remember this wrong, but Louis is was born in Belgium to a I think French mother and a British father, I think, and he talked about this kind of like th this feeling where no nowhere seemed never really seemed to fit in anywhere go yeah. goes goes to visit england and 
you know, he, he doesn't fit because the British culture and the French culture is that there's some overlap, but mostly it's very, very different. So he doesn't feel fully British when he's in England, doesn't feel fully French when he's in France or Belgium. And it's just such an interesting thing. And, and you're right, like the experience with your, with your wife and, and my wife, you know, my wife from Minnesota, she has the very same uh, feeling. Like she, she goes over there, they, they, can, they think her accent is diluted, whereas she talks to my parents here, they can say, well, she's got an American accent. It's so and, and, bizarre. You know, both of us will have worked with young people and in schools who've had so much more challenging experiences than that. Indeed. You, you've moved 15 or 16 times because of your parents' work or you've moved because of major upheavals in life or, or you know, you've, you've fled serious situations that you want yeah. to be away from. And it's that it's that sort of construction of identity and place and sort of diaspora, I suppose, like where, where do you belong? Where, how are you stretching across the spaces? Um, and how do you put roots down that I think, yeah, yeah, it's an odd one. It's why human geography for me has more, uh, more questions than answers. (laughs) That's, that's, and if you're a geographer, that's completely fine. That's, uh, that's our, uh, that's our magic that's our spark our muse um yeah I've, i think you've hit the nail on the head and thank you for uh illustrating that for so eloquently you know if i'm thinking because one of one of the groups of students i work with for my day job is um military kids so kids with from military families and they do get p- pulled from pillar to post which is one of the reasons why they're part of our strategic outreach program because they don't they they have a sh- it's really interesting. They have a very strong identity within their within their family unit as a military child, as a child of a military family. But outside that bubble, they're all over the place. They they they're so they feel so disconnected. And of course, that most certainly um, I wouldn't say interferes, but it certainly disrupts. You know their their education. They because of the, you know the lack of stability and consistency. Some kids have been um taught on the base that their family is living on some kids then go into mainstream education it's a completely different experience i mean if if here in this part of the country we have so we have a lot of american military bases air bases you know and some kids come out of that for the first time they've come they literally come out from an american school system in an isolated base into a british public school system and they're just completely thrown out um so and then as you say you extend that to young people who have got you know, exceptionally challenging circumstances like refugees and asylum seekers, they've come in and their identity, they've well, they've been ripped away from possibly where what their identity is, their, their sense of self. And I think that's where we need to be a little bit all as educators, a little bit more mindful. And we and can I use our own little experiences there, David, like you say, you moving to uh, Southeast yeah, London yeah. and feeling, ooh, this is yeah, different. But it, it's, <laughs> you know, we, when, in the last, in the last few years, and, and I think, we'd all recognize this as as practice even if we don't necessarily all want to to recognize the philosophy or or agree with the intent behind it i think there has been uh, a sort of revised focus on curriculum and curriculum journeys in in school geography and the discipline of geography where are we going how is this sequenced how are we getting the best out of the learning what is the story that our curriculum is is telling and we assume underneath that that someone's going to hear the whole story and be able to appreciate the whole story because they've been with it from the beginning yeah and i think one of the things that's really important for us to remember is some people are coming in at chapter four of this some people are coming in at chapter six some people will be with us for chapters one through four but then they're going to go and join someone else's story at chapter five you know and 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 when we talk about hearing different voices and hearing different stories and how does our curriculum support that what how how do we how do we tell our stories for those who are just coming to the map you know how do how do we how do we include everyone in that way not just not just those who were with us from when we said once upon a time you know how how do we tell the whole story and i think Geography is really good at that. Geography is really good at at a, a non-linear discipline. There isn't one right way to tell our story. There isn't one 
an only one sequence and if you weren't here when we said once upon a time then you won't understand what's going on you can pick it up you can interweave and you can you can add your own story to it that's one of the reasons i think geography is always so good it's always so powerful it it allows us to have these conversations with people and share their experience and share their stories and uh, you know and so, no and no person is a blank slate either no, no young person is a blank slate you know especially at secondary school when well I, I, I my my eldest is almost 9 my youngest is 6 and i'm just thinking of already the amount of wealth of world experience that they have and how they've interpreted that experiences and stuff like that and they are not going to go into high school with a, as a blank slate and i think i think we um the not not so much individual teachers but i, can't, I think you know the way that the the curriculum systems are set up some i think need to be a bit more malleable to that but it's it's challenging it's difficult it's not easy it's not easy at all. So we, you know, and we're not. A lot of people know I bark on about you know uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion, but uh, I also know it is not an easy task. But that should be the the joy of the challenge, really. And I've I enjoy learning new things and and seeing different interpretations of the things that I already did know to get me another uh, point I mean, of view. I think, I think uh, forgive me. I think it's Mary Myatt, but it may well be Claire Hill. I'm I'm <laughs> back, but. Yep. There's, a, there's a lovely thing about curriculum is an ongoing conversation. Yeah, It's an ongoing conversation. What, what have we had? What have we heard? What do we need to hear next? And how do we keep that conversation going? It's not a lecture. It's not a once and done. That's it. You've got it now. Download. Go and do what you want with it. It's a conversation. Um, and, and, you know, I think, that's, I think that's true of geography. Geography is a conversation. How, how is my place influencing your place? How is my experience influencing yours what what's our shared understanding what what does that mean and and so what you know um geography is it, it is a great conversation yeah and both those two individuals that you mentioned and and like um are very worth a look at folks if you're an educator at all really um i know on mary myatt's website um there is a fantastic blog series you know where you've got guest bloggers as well as um things from from mary herself and uh, it's just definitely worth worth looking at and i'll put a link in the description for those kind of things um segue in a bit from what we're talking about into a bit more about yourself now you know uh you said here that you love getting to know new uh lots of different environments landscapes and exploring new spheres and you yeah. you tell about this um this one in your first school that you ha- you were lucky enough to have uh, a trip out to north africa i mean that yeah. must have been outstanding i mean terrifying I, but but yeah but tell us about that (laughs) yeah we we um as as a school uh taught a hot deserts and arid environments unit at at sixth form um it was on the old aqa um oh god is it the old aqa 2030 spec and then we 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 picked it up and, and and took it to the cambridge international a level as well which had a deserts unit both both fantastic specifications really really great um and i think we as sort of british geographers we're comfortable with our rivers and our coasts if we're feeling like we want to push the boundaries a little bit and explore a different sphere, we'll go to the cryosphere and we might think about glaciation because obviously there's glacial relic landforms in the UK. But we don't often, you know, I think deserts is the least popular option at all A-levels. I think it's the one that, that people choose least. Um, but we loved it. The, the students loved it. We had a great time with it. The connection to rivers was really strong. And actually, if you've if you've done rivers you'll recognize loads of the desert because it's there's a lot of there's a lot of equifinality there there's a lot of stuff that looks the same um but at easter first week of the easter holidays we'd fly out to tunisia can't imagine doing it now uh, <laughs> we'd fly out to tunisia for the week and we would um get in four by fours and we would drive across the deserts and we would go up into the mountains the foothills of the atlas and then we'd come down across um across shot el jarid towards the northern Sahara, all the way down to uh, places you would know and love, Kit. Um, I have been to Moss Eisley, the set where it was filmed. Wow. We used to <laughs> stay in the in the village of Tatooine in Tunisia, <laughs> which is a real place. They named the planet in the movie after the village in Tunisia because 
That's I did where, not know that. That's that's where Lucas and his crew stayed. So the the set for most of the kind of Moss Eisley and the desert scenes in Star Wars were all filmed in southern Tunisia. And um when the crew finished, they left them there as a thank you and they were staying in the nearby town of Tatooine. All the hotels were full of Star Wars cast and crew um, for the filming and they'd drive out to the sets in the morning, they'd do their shoot and then they'd come back. And it is the least successful tourist destination you have ever been to <laughs> in your life because <laughs> the entire village of Moss Eisley is there all of the stuff. So it's it's fake walls and things. You can mm. go into the cantina, but there's nothing behind it. That was on a separate set on a soundstage and all that kind of stuff. So the entire thing, you can walk around. It looks like the village of Moss Eisley. It's amazing. But there is not a fence. There's not a gate. There's not a, a charge to get in as a tourist. There's not a single like um, gift shop or marketing experience. There's no guy wandering around in a costume dressed up to let you have your photos taken. It's empty. No one goes there. It is one of the least touristy tourist destinations you will ever go to in your life. You're just driving across the thing. You're in the middle of the desert. You park and there's a Star Wars village. And you're like, hang on, (laughs) what happened here? Um, I have also been to the, uh, the troglodyte dwelling in slightly, slightly north of that. Um, the troglodyte dwelling where they filmed the uh, the family home on Tatooine is in a different place. It's not in the same village. It's in it's in some of the cave territories. But yeah, deserts. I'd never been before. I am uh, a redhead, so Sun and me are not normally good. <laughs> um, but there's something vast and beautiful about them, and there's something spectacular about. The flatness of the the salt plains, there's something beautiful about the kind of endlessness of the sand seas, and there's something so, so dramatic about the kind of incision landforms and the waddies and the gorges and that kind of stuff. It's just, yeah, I just, just loved it, just loved it, and I I, I don't know why. I was, I was not expecting to, but yeah, special. Move over New Zealand and Lord of the Rings. In comes Tunisia and Star Wars. I did not know. That. I knew, I knew that that it was filmed on long on location, but I did not know about the whole tattooing thing. And that's just incredible. Hi folks, a chance for you to recharge your brew, but also a polite prod to remind you that it's so easy to support this podcast. Simply liking, sharing, rating and reviewing means that it will get on more people's radar. Also, there are a few links down in the description which may be of mutual benefit. Please do check them out. I can't, you know, I can't remember. Oh no, I know how I got hold of it. I actually have a Tupperware of uh, Saharan sand. I've okay. never been to the Sahara. Um, and it was given to me by, uh, I can't remember who, but it was an, a, an ex-student of mine went to the Sahara and with the family uh, on the holiday and things like that. And they actually brought home with them some Saharan sand. I'm not sure whether it's legal or whether, it, how you, or what, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, there's lots of the stuff. I mean, but yeah, anyway, sure. but um and folks, this is no word of a lie. The first thing that this, I, I, I can't, it's so sad that I can't remember the, the name of the of the young person, but I certainly remember the experience. They come up to me and they they gave me this top top where they said, you can have this. I was like, oh my God, wow, Sahara and sand. And then the first thing that they said was, um, before you, before, yeah, open it and touch it. Yeah. Open it and touch it. I was like, I know well, what right you, now? I was like. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. And I'm like. Oh my god! It is like talcum powder. Yeah. It is so Super. fine and soft. Super soft, yeah. Especially, especially as you go towards the sort of hyper arid bits of the Sahara. So obviously, Sahara is huge laterally and and longitudinally. You know, it's it's massive. But mm. as you go towards the hyper arid stuff, the the fineness of the dust particles is unbelievable, and you kind of, you, you know, we talk about making sense of the real world. It's one of those things that once you've been to the Sahara and felt how fine that powder is, you understand why it ends up on your car in the yeah. UK sometimes when the dust streams yep. come up. 
and or the solar can, my solar panels which need a clean <laughs> and, and you can kind of just about wrap your head around the fact like i don't know if you've ever been on a holiday in the canaries but there's times in the canary islands when the dust storms in the sahara kick up enough dust to cause dust storms in the canaries it's only oh, 90 yeah, miles yeah. off the coast of africa yeah um but the saharan dust will nourish and feed large chunks of the mid atlantic but they'll also feed bits of the amazon because it will be carried across oceans yeah and you kind of go oh okay right uh, but you you touch this stuff and you're like oh i see why now yeah yeah this is this is it, it's like melting in your hands it's unbelievable yeah and and it's, it's funny you say that because that is exactly how i how i um used to use that stuff i used to say to the, when they used to say what how are we going to get you know there was a few times when we were teaching it was really hazy because of the saharan sand and i and i was like i've got this tough this is brilliant i was like right right folks here we go and i i, I tipped some of it in a different tub because of course with well, the kids in their hands and fingers didn't want to so I, I put it in a little i said right pass that around and give it a feel and then we're all like oh my god i said right and that is why if you look outside you see it's a little bit of a tinge outside and things like that and it's and you know you got a bit of looks like grime and dust on your cars but that's actually saharan sand and now you can understand why it is so easily carried in the air for thousands of miles because of that and and experiences like that both as an educator and as a learner are are basically the things that blow your mind and like like you did with the with the royal institute lectures when you were when you were younger um when i always bump into kids they always remember certain things you know, yeah. one they remember the feeling that Saharan sand. They remember me doing the the earthquake and volcano simulation, and yeah. stuff stuff like that. You know, not and they, they even remember me taking them outside into the car park to look at weathering and erosion and potholes. So <laughs> the it's one just that, that tangibility. Students, the one that my students will remember is my obsession with Earth Null School. Yes, and, I wanted and to my, move on to this, <laughs> and, and, my, and my constant ability to be distracted in almost any lesson to, <laughs> to, to be able to talk about that or use that. And yes. again, that's, you know, it's just that brilliant example of actually, look, you know, we can use this thing and watch the Saharan dust being kicked up live across the across the thing. We can track it, we can follow it, we can look at all this kind of stuff. And it, you know, that's the 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 joy of geography is the same as the joy of a load of teaching it's it's taking something that people thought they knew and showing them a difference and, and bringing them a different awareness to it and saying well actually why yeah okay it is a little bit hazy it is a little bit cloudy there is some sand on your car why where did that come from <laughs> yep. and and just just watching that that person's understanding of the world expand a little bit is brilliant yeah and and it, it's a fantastic way of actually getting young people or anybody to understand how we're interconnected with other places in the world it's yeah. like when you ran your finger over your when you got in the car and you were like what's this on my fingers to come to school today you are touching a bit of the sahara and it's, it's and then they're like whoa and you start, and you start messing with because i think humans we are aware of ourselves and we are we're aware of our impact and limitations and we really struggle to step outside of that you know that that thing in the Sahara, why why is that there? Well, that was laid down when it was an ocean. Well, when was it an ocean? Well, it was an ocean here, and you know, you st you start adding weird kind of. Hang on, what? You know, those moments you get them on. I think there's a Reddit thread somewhere of stuff that feels like it shouldn't have happened at the same time, but it does. Oxford <laughs> University started teaching students 300 years before the formation of the Aztec Empire. Uh... You know, and and like well okay so here we've got the white cliffs of dover when those things were laid down what was going on in the planet we had tropical oceans britain was significantly further south and dinosaurs were running wandering around like that ability to kind of step outside your own time scale your own conception of what time even is what it's like one of those threshold concepts once you've broken that circuit in your brain you can't put it back yeah. You can't go, oh yeah, 70 years, that's fine. That's all the that's all the time I need to worry about. You've broken that in your brain now. You can't put it's magical. It back. It's yeah. a magical moment. Yeah. Yeah. So let's come back to Null School. I I don't mind talking about Null School for about five or so minutes um, because it is a free it's a free uh, platform and I know you you are its cheerleader and champion. See, like, look, like just the smile on David's face when I mentioned it, folks. It was like, whoa. So as as David's like, I'm going to get it up. So as David's just playing around and getting out, right? So, folks, 
we're recording this on the 1st of June, right? And I know what a lot of people around the United Kingdom are thinking today, and if you're in another part of the world, for end of May, June, for what the climate we should have around about this time, it is freezing, right? It is freezing. But how can we explain that? So you go into this thing called Knoll School, folks, and you have this beautiful near real-time animation of the wind currents, right? You could, And there are other things you can do. I'll let David explain. But you can see that right now here in the United Kingdom is a stream of wind coming down from uh, north of the North Sea, uh, where the boundary of the North Sea and the Arctic uh, Ocean um, funneling its way in between Scandinavia and Iceland, and it's bringing this chilly air down, and it is cooling us down for this time of year. I mean, I can go on about this forever as a meteorologist, but um, but David, I know you are an absolute cheerleader for Noel School, and I think people should go ahead and explore it. Go on, give us your highlights. I, I think the reason to explore it is because it, it's another one of those things in in what we're very fortunate to do that makes visible something that otherwise is really difficult. I can say to you that temperature changes across the planet, but if I show you a map of that live, it's different. I can say to you that temperature changes with altitude through the atmosphere, but if I show you it actually changing as we go up, it's different. I can say to you, well, that's what an air mass theoretically does and give you that, you know, as soon as I've said that, geography teachers will have the classic five arrows on a map pointing yes. turning polar maritime in their head and all that sort of stuff. But but there's a difference between looking at it and, and seeing what it looks like and how that interacts with real world stuff in swirly, messy technicolor. Um, and and the, the ability to kind of transform bits of your teaching with technology and and the way that that's been done, I think I think it's 2014. Cameron Beccario puts that puts that together, and it, it's constantly updating with live information. You can go back through a load of history. So if you've if you've got a great event that you like, you can go to that time in history and watch Hurricane Katrina evolve over the Atlantic, or you can watch the Beast from the East, or, or whatever it is that you want mm. to study. But you can you can unpick it from multiple layers. So you can go and look at what the jet stream was doing on that day. You can go and look at, you know, what what were the sea surface conditions for the Hurricane Katrina. You can go and look at what were the temperatures across Central Europe from the beast from the east. And you can really just, it's it's GIS for the weather and it's a way of making it just come alive in a way that you can't when you go outside and you look because the atmosphere is too big our view of it too narrow and it evolves too slowly to see it happening in a classroom context like i can't go outside and speed the weather up if i i could stand on top of a balcony and look out and watch the passage of a depression brilliant but i can't so um this is the next best thing i think it's it's fascinating and yeah as so and as you were saying about the different layers i mean they've added so much more over the years have gone by because when it first started up it was pretty much just wind patterns and then they've just added layer upon layer and that's the thing as well folks as david just said it's it's the layering of it so when you when you go into the air mode um and you've got all these wind patterns things like that but then you can change it from surface winds and then you can go up and this is what some people don't realize is that you don't actually when you go up into the atmosphere you don't measure quote unquote height in the atmosphere in meters or feet you actually measure height through the atmosphere in pressure um that's that's actually meteorologically a more accurate way of of going up into the upper atmosphere so so you can come up to so when you get up to roughly about the 500 to 250 hectopascals of pressure in in height and in atmosphere you get into the area of where the jet stream is, and then you can see how the uh, the jet stream is pulling air down from the Arctic, and then it's kind of shuffling its way in the surface. And then you've got the drag of the surface. We call it the Ekman spiral, which is where the surface drags the, the air in different directions. It's just wonderful. But, yeah, you can look at wind, you can look at currents, you can look at waves, uh, ocean patterns, chemical traces, particulates. Even if it says, says space, now what that does... If you click on that, it's getting you to look at the near real time image of the visible aurora. Yeah, I was like, was yeah, like that was recently yeah. added, and the and biosphere. Think, it's just, you know, we're, we're in a position where, when I grew up 
as a as a young teenage geographer we had a textbook and if we were really lucky our physical geography teacher would draw some excellent diagrams yes. on the overhead projector um, yes. and, and you know he had his projector reel and a, and a little a projector marker and that was it that was how we learned physical geography and that was how yep. we learned geography stuff you know um if we were really lucky someone would wheel in a tv with a video player attached yeah to it, oh my god <laughs> um you know, you talk about this stuff that is now on fingertips, you know, anyone can get to it, anyone can open it, it's a free thing, it's on a browser, you're talking stuff that when when we were growing up and learning geography would have been classified, like if you were special forces, or if you were um, in the in the intelligence business, you might have access to this kind of satellite data, but no one else did. And, and that sort of, um, the spread of technology has been really interesting in the teaching of geography, I think. Um, and you see, uh, you see it in a bunch of things. So um, I've always been fascinated with aviation. I've always been fascinated with infrastructure and transport and shipping. There's websites now, flight radars, the aviation one. I forget what the marine equivalent is, but you can track the position of every live ship in the world. You can track the position of every live plane in the world. And there's just this wonderful experience you can have of here's what the jet stream is. Um, here's where the aeroplanes are flying over the Atlantic. Explain. Uh, you know, the distance from London to New York is the same as the distance from New York to London. Why is one a six hour flight and the other an eight hour yep. flight? Let's have a look. You know, yep. just, just that ability to connect is is super fun. Um, and, and the technology puts it at your fingertips in a way that's um, amazing, really. You know, if, if you'd have if you'd have shown that. 20 years oh ago, you yeah. blown people's minds. And you could have put that in a university, in a university experience and people would have had their minds blown by it. And now totally. it's just gone. Totally. It's just there, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm very envious of, of folks who are still in the classroom really, because there's, there's all, especially, you know, for, for all, for all the ills and issues and problems and disparities that COVID had exploited and, and exposed, should I say, sorry, you know, the disrupt, the positive nature of the disruption through technology and stuff like that. I, I wish I was still in the classroom because there is so much. I'm, I'm thinking of all the different things I used to teach and how I taught them. And I'm thinking if I was back in the classroom now and had those tools available to me, it would just be so incredible. I mean, everything from having someone zooming from the other, other, other platforms are available, folks, you know, zooming in from another part of the planet to talk to the kids, uh, art Q and A's and stuff like that through to using things like Noel School and these trackers. It's just been, wow. So uh, quite envious of all you like. If, if, you know, send us a tweet, tweet, tweet coffee, jog pod um, and they are DR priest and tell us what you, how you've been using technology in your learning. Uh, but definitely, definitely check out Noel School. If, if you've got any time at all, check it out. Okay, David, I've got one last thing to do before we, before we end off, because we're already getting uh, short of time is uh, spilling the beans. Then we've got a few things here. Uh, you, and you said here that uh, you you uh, used to teach swimming before you taught geography. You yeah. learned to fly before you could drive, True. and um, you 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 love reading novels, particularly uh, the a huge fan of the Golden Age crime novels. I'm not quite sure which of those three we should pick up on. <laughs> I don't know. Pick, pick, pick whichever you want. Uh, oh. I, think, I think some of those are some of those are less interesting than others. To be honest, oh, um, I don't know. I think I think like like your kids. I grew up swimming a lot and and doing a lot of swimming and, and bits and pieces. Um, and for me, uh, the logical progression when I was sixteen was to go and be a pool lifeguard as a part time job. That was easy. That was like I could swim. I was comfortable in that pool. That was great. But for being a pool lifeguard's not a fun job because you spend half your time on poolside and half your time being a sort of dog's body. And <laughs> as soon as I hit seventeen, I trained as a as a qualified swimming teacher. So yeah, um, I that was how I earned my money. That was how I I paid my way through university and and kind of made money to to get through that early part of my life was very much um, swimming teaching and that was my first instructional methodology and the first time i ever got taught to teach was on a swimming instructor's course asa swimming instructor's course um and they started off by going right who knows how to juggle <laughs> so like, you are <laughs> why are we doing this i thought we were here to learn how to do swimming um but it was a really really practical 30 to 45 minute the entire cycle of skill acquisition who knows okay let's split you in half modeling um breaking down the skill building up component parts deliberate practice and correction and coaching like the whole thing in 45 minutes like this is how you teach done um oh okay <laughs> right 
uh, now we're going to do now we're going to go and do that in the pool who can do butterfly oh okay um and and yeah it was just a really uh, an um, unbelievable introduction to the world of teaching and the world of very strange experiences i don't <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to a mother and baby swimming class that's been led by an 18 year old boy who didn't know that he was going to be doing that and therefore has <laughs> his own work on nursery rhymes. But <laughs> as the person on the other side of that pool, let me tell you, it's pretty embarrassing. Shall we also <laughs> do nursery rhymes? Let's not. Huh? Let's, just, let's just try splashing and learning how to swim. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, that there was that. Um, no, I'm, I, wait a minute. I, I want to stick up. F- stick up for you and for other folks do that so when i was a kid and they used to go to you know and uh people of our age will remember like the whole butlins and pontins and all that kind of stuff right holiday parks i used to i used to adore having those little holiday park swimming clubs because the people who used to run them were, were like six formers undergrads or something you know of that age group and like like as children and as young young kids you're bes- you're actually besotted by them you, they could do anything they like and they they could not be embarrassed in your eyes. In your eyes, they were so cool. Oh, they were amazing. I was pretty embarrassed in my eyes. I <laughs> but yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what the mums or the babies thought. <laughs> I know what I thought, and it wasn't. It wasn't. Wow, I feel confident and cool here. Yeah. So you got um, you got a little tiny kit going. Oh, this this, this, this my teacher is it's so cool. That's so brilliant. And then they're probably going back to their dorm afterwards. Guys, oh my god, <laughs> I can't believe I just did that. Oh. <laughs> I don't know the wheels on the bus. Ah, <laughs> I wasn't ready. Yeah, a lot like that. <laughs> I love it. Oh, brilliant. Okay, then, David, let's uh, tie this all off now with uh, We Are All Geographers. And I'm going to, and it's so interesting that you bring up, uh, and this is actually coming full circle now because you bring up the Royal, in- the Royal Institute uh, Science Christmas Lectures. Yeah. Um, and we're going to end with someone who has given a Royal a Science Institute Christmas lecture. Because um, last week I, I spoke to uh, Professor Chris Jackson. Amazing. Yeah, what a wonderful, wonderful human being. And uh, so, and of course, he he, he did, a, I think it was 2021's Christmas lecture, I think. Yeah, um, he, was, he, did, he, he did the Earth series. And I think yeah. Helen Shirtsky did the, That's the right. Earth series. And I can't remember who did at Atmosphere. We're so was, sorry. I should know that one because the series of them in, in terms of our, our changing climate and his That's right. his on the rock cycle and the kind of earth and and geological background was amazing. Yep. Yeah, he's he's a pretty inspirational guy and and his science is incredible. But him as a human being and the and the the challenges and the adversity he's had to overcome in terms of just being himself in science yeah. and 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 bringing that weight. I don't know how he does it. I don't well, know how he does I've. It. I I tell you what last I mean it's you know it's a joy speaking to the likes of of of, of yourself you know and I love geeking out this and and like with Chris last week it was just oh what an absolute pleasure what an absolute pleasure but um so now you are now forever linked to him because he is giving you a word for you to talk about for 30 seconds right okay and um good as a as the good geologist that that geoscientist that he is He's gone yep. for the word granite. Granite. Yep. So he wow. wants you to talk about granite for thirty seconds, uh, David. And uh, you can. The trouble is, of course, as someone who's, uh, especially if you're a geography educator, you're like, okay, where do I bleed and start? It's not a case of I don't know what to sort. It's like, where do I start? But you've only got thirty seconds. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm. I'm going to talk about the remarkable in the everyday. Go for it. I think. Granite is one of those things that we all um, probably encounter more than we expect. For some of us, it's on our bathroom worktops or it's in our kitchens or it's in, you know, public spaces and on fronts of buildings. And it sits there and it looks pretty and you kind of go, oh, yeah, that's that's fine. It's it's decorative and it's whatever. You know, you see it on countertops or you see it on paving stones. And yet it's one of those things that, as soon as you start unpicking, how did it get to be that way? And why is that that way? It unpicks that irreversible change in your brain. It's that moment of, okay, that called from what? Where did that come from? How did we yeah. get that there? Why have we all of a sudden decided that 
we're going to polish dead volcanoes and that's <laughs> going to be the ideal kitchen surface. <laughs> like, like, cool, okay. Um, yep. Yeah, it's that it's that oddness of humanity, I think, the, the remarkable in the everyday. If an alien came down to Earth and said, sorry, the bits of the dead volcano that you've got on your kitchen worktop there, what's what's that about? You'd struggle to make that connection, obviously, until you really started to unpick, okay, well, what do we mean about hardness? And what do we mean about resistance? And what do we mean about crystalline structures and all of that? Same question with fossil fuels. I'm sorry, you, your most advanced part of civilization, you light dead dinosaurs on fire. <laughs> like, it's one of those things where yeah. the more you look at it, the weirder it is. Um, so notice the weirdness, I guess, is my thing about granite. It, this everyday thing that you take for granted, that you chop your veg on or you, you, know, you go past in the John Lewis shop in the kitchen counter. Notice mm. the in the everyday. And, uh, and embrace the intrusive thoughts that it brings. Oh. Sorry, I did it. Oh. I did it. <laughs> is, it okay? is it okay to go? Nice. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't get to do my puns that often, but when I do... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> yeah, very good. One of one of the one of the things I miss most about teaching is my pun stickers. Yes, exactly. Then, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm sure other um, other suppliers are available, uh, but I've, got a whole, <laughs> I've still got my whole set of lavaly and, oh, love and it. my and my you rock pun stickers. <laughs> that that there was never a student that wouldn't secretly be like, yeah, all right, okay, we take that. It's a good job. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like yeah. like people say to me like. I've done a few talks, and you know, and you'll do this a little bit with with, with ITE, uh, you know, teach training and stuff like that. It's like, okay, so what's the difference between a good and outstanding teacher? And I, I feel like from now on, I should say, good puns, yeah. stickers, <laughs> stickers, and puns, stickers and puns. Uh, well, I, if I'm honest with you, let's let's make a serious point out of that. Um, I think the answer of both stickers and puns and all of those things is not taking yourself so seriously, embracing yeah. the geekiness, embracing the joy, embracing the bits that you like and finding fun and joy in it. I think that's the thing that makes the greatest teachers. I, I don't know whether that's correlated with outstanding or, or judgments or effectiveness or efficiencies. And it's not my place, yep. but I think it is the thing that makes the, the great teachers. I think it makes the ones that you remember. Um, absolutely you know one of my mantras is um is the is the quote about being a geek by simon Pegg. i'm not going to read it out now folks you can you can look it up yourself but it's it's one of my mantras in life um before i forget david you need to come up with a word for our next guest so you got something you want to throw at someone for uh obviously you can't throw granite because you've uh just had that one but <laughs> something a little less intrusive <laughs> oh, stop it <laughs> Stop it. Um, I, I'm tempted. I'm tempted to go awkward um, from my des from my deserts conversation earlier and throw the word equifinality out there. Oh my goodness! I'm, nice. I'm, I'm I'm actually going to be kinder to to <laughs> next, and I'm going to say synoptic. What does it mean to you, synoptic? Okay. Good. Oh, I, I wish you'd stuck with equifinactic though. But okay, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> go. We'll go with. We'll go with middle. You you've got. Yeah, you've we'll, got Okay, if you want to I know it. I've got the power, but but it's the guests <laughs> that make this. Oh. Right, David. So um you've got a you've got a you've got a blog, you can definitely uh, uh plug that. Um you did it you did it when we did the the short, but you can definitely plug that again and also your Twitter feed and where people can find you. So yeah, plug away. How can we find you? Uh well, I'm always happy to talk to people about geography. On Twitter at Dr. Priest is the easiest way to get me. And I've got a blog that's pinned to that homepage. Um I talk about geography, I talk about aspirations and how to support candidates with UCAS and applications. I talk about curriculum, I talk about random stories and things that have inspired me. So you feel free to feel free to follow, feel free to have a read. And if anything grabs you or if I can have a conversation with you that's helpful then please do get in touch i'd love to hear from you yeah thoroughly recommended and finally you want to say hi to anybody oh goodness um always the most difficult question on the podcast uh I, it's it's a it's a hi and a thank you to um keith phipps and chris jackson who were the people that set me on the path to geography um without them i wouldn't have done this and i wouldn't have known how to do it i had the pleasure to get to know them both as adults and, and as one teacher to another teacher 
um, to go back and say, hey, do you know how much difference you made and that and that meant the world? Um, uh, to Mike Russell, who was my my form tutor and, and helped me with university applications, they were the people who started me down this path. Um, and always to family because without them, we wouldn't we wouldn't do this. Um, you know, you you can only do these things with the support of great people, and and those are mine. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, David, um, it's always a delight to chat to you. Uh, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm so happy that we've got to know each other quite well over the last year or two, and uh, long may it continue. So, and uh, we'll, um, and folks, we'll definitely be having David on at, back on at some point when another uh, newsworthy item uh, comes on for another espresso and geography. So you'll be hearing from David again in the future, no doubt. So, David, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks as ever, Kit. Pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favourite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep geogging.